Well, thank you all for coming anyway, through the, through the cold and the rain and the snow. And thanks to Mizan for arranging it and for giving that introduction. Um, what I want to do before we start talking about Seidnos' theology is to contextualize him, to put him in context. Now, in order to do that, we need to talk about this so-called Islamic resurgence, which we are told has been happening for the last 50 or 60 years, the Islamic revival. The Islamic revival, the Islamic resurgence, <coughs> which has happened over the last 50 or 60 years. Now, we've seen signs everywhere, and if you watch the news and read the newspapers, you will know from the current events that this Islamic revival takes on many different forms. We've seen the signs everywhere from the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood and the birth of militant Islam in the 1940s and the 1950s, through the so-called revolution, Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979 and the setting up of Islamic republics, so-called Islamic republics in Iran, Pakistan, Sudan in the 70s. And of course, to this very prominent global profile that both private and political Islam have today. But if the definitive history of 20th century Muslim movement is ever written, one wonders whether the author would be brave enough to suggest, as many thinkers have suggested, that this so-called resurgence of Islam should be seen primarily as a resurgence of social cultural identity rather than a resurgence of religious faith. So when we talk about the Islamic revival of the past 50, 60 years, my belief is that it's not an issue of the renewal or the revival of the faith. It's a revival of social cultural identity This is a position that I hold. Personally, I don't think over the past 50, 60 years that Muslims have become better believers or more proficient in their practice of Islam. Although, of course, in individual cases, this may be true. But I don't think the Islamic revival is about revival of faith. It's been about the revival of social cultural identity with an Islamic coloring. So what appears to have happened in the so-called Muslim world is an attempt on the part of certain groups to reassert their collective identity in the face of external threats. So we're talking about external political threats, threats to culture, threats to society, And along with a growing number of thinkers and a growing number of commentators, I believe that the numerous movements which in the past 50, 60 years have been described as Islamic movements have had very little, if anything, to do with the resurgence of religious faith. My belief is that most of them have been political movements with leaders whose underlying goal is to solve a specific problem. And that problem is the problem of the perceived backwardness of the Muslim world and its subservience politically, economically, and culturally to the West. So in a sense, the Islamic movements of the past 50, 60 years have been reactions. Reactions to external threats. And they've been almost exclusively political in nature. So to my mind, none of the groups that self-identify as Islamic movements can claim to be identifiable primarily as a faith movement. This is important. However, that's not to say that the issue of the renewal of faith has been forgotten. I'm not saying that. We know that throughout the history of Muslims and throughout the history of the Islamic religion, various individuals have appeared from time to time with the express purpose of renewing the faith 
We know the tradition of Tajdeed in Islam. We know the tradition of Mujaddid in Islam. So we know that from time to time various individuals have appeared with the express aspiration of promoting the revival of religion and more importantly the revival of religious faith, of belief, of Iman. Often to the extent of devoting their whole lives to that aspiration. Said Nursi, I believe, is one such individual who devotes his life to the renewal of belief. Not the renewal of cultural identity, but the renewal of belief. Now, this brings us to Said Nursi. Said Nursi is not an easy person to pin down. He's not an easy person to identify. His life's work, the Rasali Nur, is a kind of commentary on the Quran, but it's not a work of tafsir in the usual sense of the word. So it's a commentary on the Quran, but it's not a classical tafsir. Said Nursi was versed in the methods of the theologians, but we can't really say that the Risaleh is a work of theology. He's not a, theologi he's not a theologian. The Risaleh Nur, like the Quran, resists compartmentalization. We can't compartmentalize it. But if I were forced to say what the Risaleh is, I would say that the Risaleh is like a mirror, which Nursi himself says he holds up to the Quran. It's a mirror which he holds up to the Quran. So in other words, if the aim of the Quran is to guide man to belief, the teachings of the Risaleh should be seen as corresponding to that aim. So for Nursi, the Quran and the Rasale go hand in hand. The aim of the Quran is to guide human beings to belief. The aim of the Rasale is also to guide human beings to belief and to strengthen that belief and to work on that belief, to revive that belief. In fact, it's part of um, Part of why Nursi is appealing, part of why Nursi is so well liked, is because of his conviction that it's belief which must be renewed and worked on. Iman has to be worked on continuously and continually. And all other endeavors have to be approached with this goal in mind, the goal of renewal of belief. And if we think about the other scholars which were living at the time of Nursi, unlike most of them, Sayyid Nursi distanced himself from politics and from political life. And I think that this approach gives him a sense of authenticity which we can't find in thinkers alive at the same time as Nursi. So in a sense, he's unique. He stands back from the political. And this actually picks him out as someone who has a sense of Islamic authenticity. His appeal also lay in his very shrewd interpretation of the forces which are attacking Islam. Because Nursi, unlike many others, realize that if there is a conflict between Islam and modernity, if there is a conflict between Islam and modernity, it's not a conflict which is fought over issues of politics. It's not a conflict which is fought over issues of democracy, or science, or technology. For Nursi, the conflict is quite simple. It is a conflict of belief and unbelief. 
It is a conflict over the issue of imminence versus transcendence. This world and the next world. Because from the perspective of post-enlightenment man, it is man who is at the center of the universe. And of course, this is something which Islam, with its emphasis on man's utter dependence on God, cannot accept. So in a sense, Nursi has come to restore God to the center of the universe. From Nursi's point of view, salvation consists in choosing the transcendent over the imminent. In other words, of choosing God over the self. And so it's the dynamics of this choice which give us the key to understanding Nursi's approach, his approach to spirituality. Now, the S word, spirituality, what do we mean by spirituality? Well, spirituality is a very hard term to define. And we know, for example, that there are as many different approaches to Islam as there are Muslims. And I guess the same applies to spirituality. There are as many definitions of spirituality as there are people to define it. There are lots of different interpretations and definitions of spirituality. And the term is even used to describe the feelings of closeness that some people feel to a higher force, these very vague feelings. People say, oh yes, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Even when they don't actually follow any institutionalized faith. For our purposes, a definition of the spiritual in Islam can be found in the Quran itself. If the word spiritual means connected or concerning the spirit, then the Islamic revelation, the Quran, makes it quite clear that the human spirit is an uncreated entity, breathed into man by God himself. So man's spirit is that thing which connects him to the divine and which transforms an otherwise transient material being into the Khalifa of God on earth. All human beings have the potential to be Khalifatullah, capable of rising above all other beings to take his rightful place in eternity as the highest of the high. So from the perspective of the Quran and of mercy, spirituality means human beings' quest to uncover the reflection of the divine within himself. So as Nursi says time and time again, the reflection of God lies in every human being, in every atom indeed. And spirituality for human beings is the quest to uncover that reflection. The reflection of the divine which exists in our spirit. So the creation of human beings took place not only so that human <coughs> beings would affirm God's existence and bow down to divine law through performing certain rites and rituals. For Nursi, God is not just a principle which has to be accepted. God is not a principle which has to be accepted. Or a lawmaker who is to be obeyed. Now, while the God of the Quran, of course, is, in, is absolute and theoretically unfathomable and ultimately unreachable in every sense of the word, God can be understood through his creation. And this is what Nursi does in a very, um, how can we say, inclusivist manner. The whole of the creation is a reflection of God. And God can be understood through his creation. More importantly, God can be gradually 
discovered or uncovered by human beings who are able to approach God and become ever more aware of what God is by virtue of the fact that man is created in God's image. And while we don't have that notion in the Quran, there is a tradition, a prophetic tradition, which says that man is created in the image of God and has the capability of attaining communion with God. So in Quranic cosmology and in the writings of Sayyid Nursi, man is the reflection whose purpose in life is to perceive and to understand the reflected. So creation is the reflection. And the goal of creation is to understand the one who is reflected. And when we do this, Sayyid Nursi says, we solve the riddle of our own existence. Human existence is a riddle, is a puzzle. And Sayyid Nusi says that human beings possess the key to unlock that puzzle. So, from Nusi's perspective, spirituality doesn't mean becoming more godlike. In fact, it means the reverse. As we'll see as we go through today and tomorrow, it's about Spirituality is about realizing that those attributes in us which appear to make us like a God actually belong to someone else. The attributes which we find in ourselves and which appear to make us godlike, and which for post-enlightenment man puts man into the center of the universe, Said Nossi says no. Those attributes do not belong to human beings. Those attributes belong to someone else. So it's not about becoming more godlike, more holy. It's about understanding that actually we own nothing, that we have nothing, and that whatever we have is a reflection. So the spiritual journey of man towards God is not about becoming more like God. And sometimes I've asked Christian friends, what do they understand by spirituality? And they say, it means becoming more godlike. And in fact, it's the reverse. It's becoming less godlike and more like a mirror. So spirituality for Islam and for Nursi is about purifying ourselves of all of these claims to godlikeness. All of the claims that we make. I am this. I am powerful. I am wise. I am intelligent. I am strong. Spirituality means <coughs> purifying ourselves of these claims. So that God can reveal himself through the spiritualized soul. It means not acting like God, but acting in God's name. This is the big difference between Islamic spirituality and Christian spirituality. It means not acting like God, but acting in God's name. It involves not being like Him, but manifesting or revealing Him. So for this to happen, of course, one has to clear out the clutter of the self. All of this rubbish that we gather inside in our own souls. All of these claims that we have. Islamic spirituality is about clearing all of these things out. This imaginary ownership that we exercise over our own beings, over our own attributes. And we do this so that the image of God can be reflected in the mirror of our being. And then what do we do when we realize that these attributes belong to God? We have to hand them back. We have to surrender them to God. And the secret of taslimiyah, taslim, or being Muslim, means handing back these 
attributes that we've stolen from God. So this is Cygnus' approach to the spiritual. And the Rasul Ali Nur is a work which is designed to enhance the spirituality of the believer. So that's all I wanted to say about the overall aspiration, the overall goal and objective of the Rasul Ali Nur is to enhance human spirituality. <laughs>